Welcome to this week's Eccentric Minute, brought to you by Eccentric. This week's Eccentric Minute is one of my favorite exercises to do with the K-Pulley, and that is the pull-through. Guys, once you've figured out about how far you need to walk out with the K-Pulley, grab whatever attachment you're using for the pulley, walk yourself out there, and really push your hips back at the K-Pulley. From there, when you hit that stretch, really punch your hips forward, keep your chest up, and try to extend your knees and your hips all the way through. And this is where one of the major benefits of using a flywheel kicks in, as it pulls you into a deeper stretch as you push your hips back in, into your hamstrings and your hip extensors, so that you really open it up and stretch everything out in the back. This is an exercise that I'm sure your athletes are going to love to hate, but reap awesome rewards from. I really hope you enjoyed this week's Eccentric Minute. Make sure you check them out at eccentric.com to find out everything you need about the K-Box and the K-Pulley. Being a strength and conditioning professional requires constant pursuit of better knowledge, better methods, and better means. But what if there was a place where strength and conditioning coaches could learn from some of the most innovative practitioners in the world, such as Jeff Moyer, Lachlan Wilmot, William Wayland, James the Thinker Smith, and Kirwenham Flat? Well, you could find multiple lectures from each of these top-level coaches and a few lectures and examples from yours truly as well all in the Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is going to bring you well over a hundred different lectures from some of the top practitioners in the world to be your one-stop shop for your continuing education and professional development. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASP today and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. That's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASPS to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, we have an absolutely sensational discussion with Nikoa's Ryan Gallup on the training of rugby athletes in a high-performance model. You know, guys, we are going to start right out, dive right into some of the issues and the confusions that Ryan sees around the game of rugby and, and the training of these athletes, and really where these confusions kind of have matriculated from. Uh, this is going to lead him right into his model, you know, where these ideas came from, and why there needs to be a distinct difference between how we train American football players and rugby athletes. Next, he's going to dive right into how he sets up his program alongside with the coaching staffs, including how these conversations with the coaches drive the KPIs that they use, to make sure that this training is providing the results that the coaches and athletes are truly looking to achieve. You know, he then is going to share with us the role of the fundamentals of sprinting and cutting and change of direction, and how important technique work is, even with the highest level of player. You know, and this includes, you know, a, a unique little uh, part to whole approach that he's implementing, you know, with the practice warm-ups leading into the practices with the teams that he gets to work with. This is really an awesome talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Ryan, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Thanks for having me, Jay. Really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, man. Stoked for this one. We've been talking a bit off camera here about where we're going. You know, obviously we we throw ideas back and forth here on the on the interwebs and all that. But you know, for the three quarters of a human that doesn't know who you are and what you're cooking out there in Cali, brother, let, let's let them know what you guys got going. For sure. So um, I'm performance director here at NACOA. Um, we are training in physical therapy center in Carlsbad, California. We work with all demographics um, as far as athlete, non-athlete. We have a full physical therapy clinic. We do off-site work with high school and youth programs, teams, and um, we are, I'd say, reputation-based. We have a strong reputation in the action sports world, just being in SoCal, a lot of professional um, snowboarders, skaters, surfers come to us for their performance training. So we definitely got a good niche going there. And then personally, I've been playing and involved with rugby for a long time. So that's definitely kind of a passion sport for me. Um, I've seen it kind of evolving in America and it's heading in the right direction. But I definitely also see we're behind in a lot of ways as far as the high performance goes. And uh, as you know from the journals and the studies, some of the best high performance people in the world are in rugby. And we have some really good ones in America, but just not as many as these other countries. So, you know, lately I've been trying to 
help kind of get proper content out to that uh, part of the world, you know, because there's in the rugby world, what I've seen, there's, I mean, there's ex players who are the coaches, which is awesome. I'll coach when I'm older. My sons are playing for sure. But there's, there's some dads who are helping out, bless them, but they've never played before. And a lot of times with these clubs or whatever, you know, they're trying to train the kids as well because they know rugby is an insanely physically demanding sport from the collisions, the fitness, the skill. So they're trying to put that in and whether, you know, they're improperly using football type training or they're doing what they did when they were younger, which we can all fall into occasionally if we're not careful. And they're just not, you know, they're unless in America, unless you're with a pro team, you're with the USA one of the top level international sides, or you're going to one of the large D1 colleges like a Cal or a BYU, St. Mary's that treats it like a varsity sport and is going to have like a collegiate strength coach like you working with the team. Unless you're in that 5% group, you're probably, you know, going on Instagram and YouTube and trying to find rugby training and whatnot. And hopefully they're finding decent stuff from guys like Kier and whatnot. But for the most part, from what I see, there's a there's a lot of bullshit out there. So I'm definitely trying to help out in um, education as far as the masses go, athletes, coaches, parents, and then the people we get to work with in San Diego. Having a you know really leaving a good footprint on that. I used to work with the USA Sevens team. A lot of those players are either still playing or they're in the coaching world now. So I've been able to kind of get in with some new organizations, and we're trying to bring kind of that proper high performance programming, but also kind of the, the mindset and the, the lifestyle choices that these younger athletes should make if they want to make this a, a career or just have a great time in college playing at a high level. Some kids have overseas aspirations, which is great. That's where the rugby is best. You know, if you go to Europe or the Southern Hemisphere, you're going to, you know, see the highest level. But these guys need, you know, at an earlier stage, getting exposed to the the high performance demands you know we've joked about it before like rugby is kind of like you got to be ready for collisions like in american football but without pads so you better have a lot of technique in your tech uh rucking and tackling or else you're gonna blow yourself up but you also need to have that high level of fitness you cover miles in a you know a full 15s match is 80 minutes uh, and some of the bigger players, the way forwards move nowadays, they cover more ground than the backs. So you got guys that you want to be your biggest, strongest, most powerful athletes also having to run five miles at high intensities and at different movements through a game. So the difference between football and rugby on a fitness and an energy system standpoint is that's probably the, the, the biggest gap. And in America, naturally, we have a lot of football players who cross over into rugby. They, whether they're really good in high school, didn't want to play in college, maybe they wash out in college, they see they can possibly make it. I mean, some of USA 7's best players currently, Perry Baker, Carlin Isles, they were football players who also had Olympic level track speed. And when they saw, you know, a future in football kind of dwindling, they made the jump and it took some years. But they, the biggest thing they needed to do to get to that level was improve their energy systems because there's a ton of 100 meter athletes who've tried to play football, try to play rugby, and they gas out after one run because that's all they're ever built for, right? Football, as Kier talks, he does an amazing job talking about the dynamics of football. Your average play is like three to five seconds, and you have 40 seconds between plays. In rugby, if there's not a knock on or a penalty, you can sometimes go for a minute or two. And if you're a guy who's making a lot of hits or hitting rucks or, you know, a nine or a 10 who's doing a lot of the distribution, you're covering side to side during, you know, on the pitch for a whole game. Like if you don't train that way as far as both your practice sessions, but also looking at your energy system work in the preseason and in the off season. You know, a lot of teams, they suck the first two months of every season and it's because they're playing themselves into shape. And that's kind of that's not a good thing if you're going to start your season two and four, because everybody just lifted all. You know, I used to play club. I know that everyone wants to do all the lifting on their own. They don't want to do the running. And the running is actually where, you know, 
that's where the good teams are going to have an edge is if they are just fitter and they don't slow down as the game goes on. No doubt. And when you're looking at that model that you're, you're building with these young people that you get to coach and then the pros that you're going to get to work with here in the near future, uh, let's talk about how you're breaking that down. Let's talk about how you're looking at the game. Because really, like, I, I think that where people – and I'm a novice when it comes to anything to do with rugby. So it's, but I think that where people confuse it, especially in America, is they try to make it a little bit too much like American football and a little bit less like Aussie rules. And they probably should be looking a little bit more south than they are right now. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, I mean, I played football too. It's actually, I love it. I played rugby longer, so I've naturally said I love it more, but I love both of the sports. But there's even from a cultural standpoint in football, like the big hits, you know, the kill shots, the blindside blocks like that gets the fan ooing and eyeing. The problem with football is every play has a very, you know, a sudden ending. So that's when everyone can celebrate and blah, blah, blah. And granted, there's a different culture around celebration in rugby anyway. But like in rugby, the play goes on like making a big hit is only really good if you like get to your feet and poach that ball from the guy you tackled and create a turnover or else it's me. You might've just expended more energy than you needed to. And everyone loves a good hit, but it's, you know, the best international flankers. It's not the hardest hitters. It's who makes the most tackles in a game. It's who makes the most rucks or poaches the most ball. And with all of that is a giant energy cost. It's not just cause you, you're bigger and stronger in these short little breakdowns, but it's that you can fly all over the field and be there before the other team. Or if it, there is a challenge, you are stronger to get that ball or win the ruck. But like the, you know, the idea in football and we've all seen it, whether it's guys failing conditioning tests. And I know a lot of the conditioning tests they use aren't very smart either. We've, I've heard a lot about that on Eric and Kier's chat yesterday on just fly, which was awesome. Like, we're doing 300s, which is honestly, that's more like rugby type conditioning, like a possible possibility of a 60 second you know, run of play. In football, it's all three to five seconds. So why would you do that? But the idea being you need no matter what, like in football, you can be big and strong and fast and powerful and have sh shit fitness and still be really good at it. Unless maybe you're a wide receiver or a corner because they're covering so much ground in a game. But in you know you have such long to recover if 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 you can put out five seconds of energy and you have 40 seconds of rest most athletes even if they're slightly deconditioned are going to be able to recover and put out more uh, you know energy again on the next play but in rugby when that run of play goes and you know some teams play that style on purpose they run a lot of phases that are safe they're trying to wear that other team down maybe get them collectively crowded around the ball and then spin it wide that's a total strategy I think literally they mentioned it yesterday, like how the All Blacks play. Like first half, other teams are – they're like purposely like just like analyzing that other team and going – not going through the motions, but they're looking at weaknesses and getting that other team tired. Another team might feel pretty good about themselves. And then the last 30 minutes, they score five tries and win in a blowout. And, I mean, that's their style – but that style of play would not work if they were not elite conditioned athletes. And they are. The All Blacks are always known for being the fittest team out there. And that's not an accident. That's how they prioritize. You know, they do weight room sessions where it is just strength and power built. But the, their practice speed, you know, very up tempo, not a, not a whole lot of time on the field, but it's really intense when they're there. The running work, the testing, it's geared towards knowing that if we are fitter than the other team, we already have an advantage. I started realizing that later in my, you know, when I was playing 15s for my local club, we were doing more running in the fall and everyone freaking hated it. But then we'd hit the ground running in January for preseason. Other teams were trying to play themselves into shape and we were ready and we would roll teams just because we were fitter. They might have been bigger, stronger, maybe had a couple more talented people. But, it, you know, when it's 30 guys on the field collectively, the team that can have higher energy and get around the pitch better is always going to win. And that prioritization is something that if coaches are looking at football for rugby training, they're going to miss, a, they're going to have a giant gap. You can get, you know, all the 
the combine type training that you see sometimes rugby people doing, it's like they don't do three point starts. You know, broad jump is a great measure to see their horizontal power and maybe it translates to, you know, acceleration and tackling. I like to think it does, but that doesn't mean training broad jump technique is going to make them any better at rugby. So I think, you know, a lot of the best training that you can see online is like more of that combine or track style training for speed. To me, a lot of that stuff does not translate to the rugby field. A lot of the stuff, you know, I heard you guys with Jeff a couple weeks ago on that round table, like what you guys are talking about is like reverse engineering the game. What are the movements these guys really do in a game? Like as far as setting up a cut or, you know, in rugby, they call it a soft shoulder. You want to get the defender slightly off access and then run at his soft shoulder. So even if you can't step him or run through him, you might have the weak arm reaching back. And through that, you can either possibly break through that or have an arm free for an offload or just get go forward ball so that the team, you know, you don't have guys in your support flying offside because you're dancing. A lot of the the footwork and stepping in football actually is counterproductive for rugby because it's a go forward game and there's no blockers. You're in front of everybody. So if I stop and dance and place a bunch, I'm actually going to have guys on my team getting out of position for it. So knowing like, hey, the cutting we need to do in rugby, it's more like, you know, you can still do your one cuts and your two cuts, but it has to be at pace and it has to have a reason. If you're dancing or backpedaling, seven's a little different, bigger feel, less players, you can get away with that stuff. But in 15s, you know, regular rugby union, everything needs to be forward. So your, your, your cuts or whatever, it's the, there's there's certain drills you can do for those that would probably help football players, to be honest. Because football players tend to dance a little more and do big lateral jump cuts. Those work in, you know, when you have time. But the cutting in rugby is actually great for that last second. Reading the defender, knowing he's all right, he's committed, he turned his hips. Let's step, let's step back on him and get that soft shoulder and run through it. Like that's kind of where I have a passion for the speed and agility, is it's how it actually how you see it in a game and how can you reverse engineer it and build drills and reactive components that can translate, not just run a bunch of cone drills. That's, you know, that's footwork. And at the high, as we know, at the higher levels, even if guys don't have perfect footwork, they're athletic enough and they're probably big and strong and fast enough that their footwork is for the most part good enough. You can fine tune things here and there. But once the fundamentals are down, it's like, how do we actually get you to use all this speed and power when the opposition is, you know, running a lazy defensive line and you could put your left foot in the ground, go at his soft shoulder and break through, like taking these skills that maybe they innately have from being athletic and playing other sports as a kid, but putting it in the context of like, this is how it's going to present to you in a game. This is what you're going to see, you know, when you're, we call an arrow and you're a big prop and we want you running a hard inside line. It doesn't mean you just have to crash it and get tackled. You know, if you can create a soft shoulder, you can run through that. You're uh, an ox, but do you have the wherewithal and the skill to do that at game speed? That's, that's kind of what I'm trying to instill when we do our field based speed and agility work, whether it's with the high school or the new pro team, we're going to start helping with it's, it's all game driven and making sure they understand that. Like, this is even if you see a cone that's only there for this week, it's going to be a defender next week. And the idea is just taking an angle off of this step. And, you know, once that's there, then we build in the reactive component. You react to the way the defender slides or you listen to the coach. He wants a tight ball. So you got to change your line at speed. Like, can we do that? Can we execute that? I got to sit down with some the two of the skills coaches that we work with the pro team and they were specific like this is the type of attack we run so our guys need to run these lines in our lineouts are some of our forwards drift when they jump so could you help us with like jump mechanics of like coming in and out of sprint and back pedal and jumping straight up and being quick with the hands it's like it's almost like athletic based counter movement jumping but it was awesome because it was like this is this is knowing exactly what the coaches want to see you know, we can look at the KPIs in the weight room to see if they actually got better. But I want these coaches over the, you know, 
the preseason and when we get into games to be like, he's doing that better. So something's working or shit. He's still taking extra steps. Can we work on that on Thursday mornings on the field? Yes. Like that's kind of what I'm building into is like, you're already at this level. So how do we get it even better so you can get better as a rugby player? Even if you're 28 years old and in your prime, you might never be more athletic or stronger, but skills can always improve. And that's kind of where I want to fit in. It's like the movement skills like that actually transfer and apply and they get it. They like it because they've been lifting weights and running gassers their whole lives. But when you can actually be like, I'm going to help you be better at stepping so you can score more tries. They're like, heck yeah, help me with that. A hundred percent. And I think though that, you know, the things that you're talking about now, when we're, we're looking at the specific and working our way back to the general is that all of these things, right? You know, you're talking about the fitness stuff, you're talking about their movement stuff. It all comes back to like, when we're talking about energy systems, the basics need to be there. Like you have to build the aerobic system. When it comes mm-hmm. to the movements and, and the skill work, if we may, or agility or whatever we want to call it, starting with the cone drills and teaching how to plant and go and what these actual movements are, or the jumping, how to actually get your feet in the ground and load and go up vertically so you're not flying forward. I think right now there's a lot of people that love to go to like this sexy, new, cool, we're just going to do all this crazy stuff type idea. But like you wouldn't give a 15 year old the keys to a Ferrari, Mm -hmm. right? Like, and we know, or at least we say we know, right? We always talk about all this stuff with trainings. It's like, well, you build the general. So we have this huge, pyramid that we can build off of and we can get into that and and that's probably more like a beer talk as to whether there's actually a pyramid or not but like people skip that so it's really it's 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 great to hear that you're actually going all the way there to build this general stuff so that you know no pun intended like an avalanche but there's actually a ball to roll down the mountain 100 percent. and with them it's just like i mean it's the same philosophy i use with whether it's the action sports kids in here or the high schools we work with, we're always kind of, uh, you know, they don't know, most of them don't know what the hell a meritocracy is, but I, we always preach like, Hey, you want to do that high end stuff, whether it's, you know, crazy ass plyos or, you know, um, you know, bands and change for accommodating resistance, O lifting, whatever it is, you want all that, but you have to earn it. And I'm always big on that with like the speed and agility fundamentals. Like, I don't want to ever use cones and not have everything be reactive because that becomes way more transferable. However, if you can't do a basic crossover to 90 degree turn, like at the end of a warm up, then we need to freaking fix that. And for a lot of the, like I said, with the athletes, some of them, they love the fundamentals because they've been so good forever. No one's ever talked to them about it. And even the other day they did the pro team did a 30 minute, the 30 meter sprints and I slow mode videoed all of them and they were like, they're going to be anxious to see it. And I, I think they almost want some constructive criticism because some of them are just freaking horses and that's why they're fast, but maybe they've dealt with hamstring or calf, you know, injuries in season before. So we can help them work on gait or mobility. Like the idea is like, a lot of elite guys definitely get to the elite level because of what they were born with, especially in rugby. I mean, some of these Polynesian boys, you look at them, they don't need the weight room. The weight room is almost like to just keep them disciplined and make them a little bit more movement robust, but they'd be 270 and strong as shit with absolutely nothing. It's genetics. So it's just like some of the fastest guys. We know that. Like some of the fastest guys, if you just did like, mobility work and occasionally some strength work, they'd still be fast as shit. Some of them you can do all unloaded, just plyos and body weight, and they'd still be fast as shit. Like they're fast as shit because they're fast as shit. So it's more like, that's why I like the movement skills. Because for these guys, I'm speaking to them like, I'm not really like the training we're going to do is not geared to get your 30 meter. If, if we even retest it later in the season better, I don't really give a shit to be honest. I'd rather that 30 meter happens, maybe the same speed, maybe the same speed. Maybe you get up to top speed quicker. That'd be nice acceleration because that's really important on the field. 
but more like that you're doing it calmer. You have better mechanics. And because I'm, I was talking to half of them the other day, they're all freaking out. Like they're squatting heavy while they run. I'm like, you're running with your muscles. Your eyes are closed. You look like you're about to take a dump. Like you would not sprint on the field with like that. So it doesn't really help to do it now. Like I was talking to one of the props who's actually a really good runner for his size. And I was like, you're just stressed. I'm like, if you were sprinting on the field, you'd be chasing somebody or you'd have the ball and think, holy crap, I'm the prop who's about to go up 30 meters for a try, which is rare. But you'd be focused and you'd be scanning and you'd be in that moment. You would not be eyes closed running as fast as you can because that shit doesn't work. So getting them to realize like, hey, what we do, everything we do together is meant for in game. Like I remember you and Jeff were talking about that, like there has to be the subjective side of it. I need to hear from the coaches and the tape. Like he's moving better. He looks more relaxed and he's actually not getting as tired later in games because he's moving more relaxed earlier. You know, the, the energy system side of it is very affected by, you know, stress and nerves and like over tensing. If we can get them to play, move really quickly, but in a more relaxed state, they're not going to burn themselves out as fast. And in rugby, especially the bigger players, usually there's a, they know they're not playing the whole game. A prop's trying to go 50 minutes. So make it to halftime, 10 minutes in, a lot of the front row is going to get subbed out. So if those guys are, if they're moving around better in the beginning of the second half, they might get some extra playing time. That's motivation for them if they happen to start to be on the field longer. Some of the bigger forwards are not going to get subbed out. So the, these are huge people who are flying all over the field and they have to play 80 minutes. The more efficiently they can move, the better chance they have of still being useful at the end of the game when it matters. You know, the thing with rugby, it's different in football. Actually, a lot of games are not very dramatic endings because a team can have a you can have a five point lead with you know three to five minutes left which is only one try and that team can just slow play that ball until the game's over and they can just I mean but that is you better have fresh people who are able to do that because the other team is just trying to rip the ball out of their hands poach every single tackle because their only hope is a turnover at that point so if you have a bunch of your forwards or hands on knees by the end of the game and you're trying to seal the victory, you're in trouble. That's when the other team could turn it over, go 80 meters and steal the win from you. And that happens occasionally, but the smart teams are so fit. They just, they're, they, there's, you don't see a lot of difference in the flow of their game at the end. Like I even think of that from the training we did in men's club. We used to have guys who walked on our college field. And like, I was like, I want to keep playing after college. We were a good D1 college team, but we still had big dudes who'd walk. Once I got to a higher level in men's club, you would have been yanked in. If you took three steps walking on a field, you were out. And it was like, geez, we're older now, but we are way fitter than we were in college. But it's because we're making ourselves do this extra running in the preseason. Our practices are way higher tempo. We actually play the game a lot in practice because – there's no better conditioning than actually playing the sport, especially the field sports. We all know that. No doubt. And again, that's why building that big aerobic engine is so important because now you have, I mean, and we don't need to get into this. I mean, the inner, inner workout recoverability and recovering between and blah, blah, blah. But again, like <laughs> if you're teaching them the skills to move better, if you're teaching them or you're building the engine for it, now you start to increase specificity, all the stuff that we say we do, and then you have your ability to discuss with the athlete what is and isn't working. And on top of that, you have your measurables, which like with, with you guys would be similar to what we look at. Like, are you driving by your opponent? Are you running by your opponent? Are you missing tackles? Are you making tackles? Are you keeping people in front of you? Um, the scoreboard sometimes works too, you know, allegedly. I mean, like, you know, obviously, though, the, the one thing that we can't ever take into account is, well, yeah, this week was great because the other team stunk or this week was bad because the other team is freaking awesome and yeah, it's just just better than us, you know, but mm, that's the sure. point flip that we get. But I think that all of that, again, is just so we talk about it, but you know, like 
like Alejo says, man, like it's all this stuff we talk about, but do we actually do it? Yeah, for sure. The, the setup I have with the pro team, I'm super excited about just cause like Thursday mornings, I'm going to go out in the field and help them. But it literally like, I'll be working with the backs on like 35 minutes of very specific speed stuff. And they immediately go into their skill session with the coach and I I'll know ahead of time what drills they're going to run or what attack pattern they're at. So from the reverse engineering side, I literally got the doc a month ago. It was like, here's our first three weeks. Here's what I want to do. So what would you do before that to prep them? So from transferability standpoint, it's going to be amazing. Like, oh, we're, you know, you're working on a long curve type line on this day. Then we're going to work some curve linear sprints and teach them body position and technique. And then it'll feed right into a drill with a freaking ball in their hands and a defense. So it's not like when you teach something and you have to tell them, like, remember this when you go into the game. It's literally going to be like, we're done. Get a sip of water. And now you're with Coach Zach. And now you're going to do that shit against defense. And let's let's see it work. And even I'll be there during that session. I can pull guys aside and be like, hey, that angle we talked about earlier, you kind of shorted it. And that's why you didn't get around the guy. But, you know, all that information they can get on the moment it's almost like you know movement-based data like it's it's live it's hey we ran this curve and then you did that curve and guess what you're fast as shit and you skinned the wing that's exactly what we want you to do and it's you know just a reminder of hey that angle made the difference and then the more you drill that in their heads the more likely you'll see it in the game right thousand percent it's it's crazy that whole part whole thing i guess just seems to seems to work you break it down you teach it to them slower you let them build it up and then you put it in a game type situation it just like i don't know maybe it's maybe it's been something that's been around for a long time i don't know <laughs> <laughs> right well listen ryan let me get you out of here with this man like where can people see more of what you're doing where can they keep up with these things that you got going on and, and where can they where can they find out more for sure so, um, uh, Nicoa is de definitely my main home. Um, everything we work on the outside, uh, revolves around us. So our, uh, we have NicoaFit.com website, Nicoa performance on Instagram. I'm RG one Nicoa. Um, like I said, I'm working with the San Diego protein now, the Legion. That's going to be cool. There should be some content and kind of education we're build from what we do with them this season, which I'm really excited about. And then rugby nation is a new, um, site that I'm partnering with. It kind of feeds into what I was saying earlier about, you know, I've, I'm partnering with some of the old USA players that I've been friends with for years and I've helped train throughout the years. And the idea is we're trying to bring proper both training, nutrition, and even skill-based work to kind of the rugby community that doesn't have access to coaches like myself or like Kier or like guys like Sam who've been in that, we've seen that world. But in rugby, that's a tiny world. There's only a handful of people who are ever going to play internationally or professional. Like, I'm a part of my passion is I grew up playing rugby, and I never had good rugby coaching until I learned this shit myself and started training myself at 25. Like, if I could add access to this kind of knowledge and just sucking it up and knowing that running based and off feet conditioning was not an option, it's an absolute must. And, you know, whether it's the, the speed and agility, like fundamentals type ebooks, but then building into kind of this transition of, all right, you got the fundamentals. How do you progress that into actual scenarios that are going to impact your game? So that, yeah, so that's Rugby Nation. That's um, that's an exciting kind of side project. We want to actually do online coaching for them as well, which we're going to do through NACOA and be able to, you know, if we have athletes who get through our basic programming and they're like, we want more. We want more of that one-on-one -on -one touch or the, Hey, I need to come in for testing and get a yearly program done. We're able to do that through our software and our team of coaches. Awesome, brother. Well, we'll make sure we got all those links and, and all those apps in the notes and truly appreciate your time, Ryan. This is sensational stuff. My pleasure, Jay. Again, thanks a lot for having me. I uh, can't wait to get beers in Richmond next summer. Yeah, man. Well, first one's on me, brother. Always great rapping and chopping it up, brother. Appreciate you, man. We'll be in touch real soon. Cheers. Yeah, man.
And a huge thanks to Nicola's Ryan Gallup for spending the time with us today. Guys, just some open, honest, candid sharing from a guy really paving the way in a, in a niche that a lot of us need to take more from. You know, he's right when he says that the rugby world seems to have a, a better grasp of this high performance model. And I think that there's a lot that we can learn from people like Ryan who are implementing this at a, at a grander scheme and are trying to kind of make it to scale for athletes of all these different ages and, and levels. And, you know, the work that they're doing with Rugby Nation is going to be great. So make sure, guys, you're giving him a follow at rg one Nakoa. That's at RG, the number one, N-A-K-O-A. And give them a follow at Nakoa Performance. And make sure you're checking out RugbyNation.com and NakoaFit.com to keep up with everything they're doing. Ryan, truly grateful for everything you're doing, brother. Keep up the great work. It's, it's definitely appreciated. And as always, guys, if you did enjoy the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. As always, we're just trying to get the best information out there to all the great coaches that we can. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.